and assess the direction of travel for the day. Uh, let's kick off this morning with Adi Msirovich, Senior Research Fellow at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. Adi, another day, the oil price opens higher in Asia. The situation in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico, the next hurricane is on its way. This is a significant supply disruption. Absolutely, Sean, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite a, a, a difficult market at the moment because, as we said, it was a tropical storm that turned into a hurricane. It's kind of been quite unpredictable. Um, I think we still uh, are losing about at least 800,000 barrels from the previous one. I think uh, in total, I think we've lost about, so far, my count is about 26 million barrels of total production and likely to do a lot more. Uh, and now we've got this other storm, which is quite unpredictable. We don't know what's going to happen, how it's going to impact uh, the production, certainly not in a positive way. So the market is, is definitely pricing that in. Um, uh, and, and on top of that, we, we do have a fairly tight market, Sean, as you know, we've been drawing all this time. Q4 is supposed to be the strongest quarter anyway. And, and, and Goldman um, uh, reiterates there sort of the, the revenge of the old economy uh you know going ahead so um it, it's been a quite quite a tough market certainly what we're seeing in the market right now is the sort of response to the supply problems uh demand is a slightly different story but i'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit more yes let's go to uh lebanon uh, laurie hatayan mina director at the natural resource governance institute laurie it seems impossible to start any conversation with somebody in beirut without talking about beirut uh, even if its ramifications for the world are not as significant as the gulf of mexico perhaps but nonetheless uh, we had the announcement yesterday from uh, the head of hezbollah that the iranian fuel tanker that the country so desperately needs will be arriving this week and at the same time you have a new prime minister all things looking up for lebanon so it looks uh a bit uh, complicated that you have a new functioning government at the same time you have uh, a, a faction or a, a political party, very influential kind of a militia, uh, bringing in a sanctioned product from Iran and bringing it through Syria into the Lebanese soil. So it's like two, uh, two uh, identities clashing the uh, sovereignty versus like a state within the state. So it's a very interesting uh, dynamics. Uh, Especially for a new billionaire prime minister who I'm sure has assets all over the world and uh, he wouldn't want to get on the US naughty list. So I think what the, what the atmosphere in Beirut is that the US is on board with what's happening and okay. they are okay with the ir Iranian tankers coming to Syria and crossing uh, the pro product, the diesel crossing to Lebanon uh, from Syria, it seems that the prime minister uh, has the blessing of the French uh, and the French have been in good terms with the Iranians and all that created the, uh, all, all that created the forces for the formation of the government. Unfortunately, I wish I would have said that this is a blessing that comes from within the uh, Lebanese uh, citizens, but no, the blessing is international, regional blessing that has had brought into forming uh, the government. Uh, and, uh, and definitely that will have implications. What happened in Beirut and this uh, opening up of the French with the Iranians, the Americans not, uh, uh, not opposing the tankers arriving, that will have a significance on the other, uh, uh, on the other table, of, uh, which is the JCPOA uh, uh, and the table of negotiations that had been stopped since June. But, and then August Raisi became president. And now we are seeing this American opening up and, uh, and the French intervention. So we might see some, uh, 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 some uh, uh, good uh, gestures and some, um, if you want, uh, positive signs of re, uh, re, restarting the negotiations uh, in, in Vienna because Did everything you... is linked in, in the region and uh, with the international the talks uh, as in the nuclear talks you mean yeah definitely definitely so these are signs you know like uh, these are signs of rapprochement in different places that will lead up to rapprochement uh, on the vienna table so uh, having a, a government that is pro hezbollah pro iran and the us not objecting to us this is a sign having the french being involved and the french are coordinating in uh, with the americans and the saudis on lebanon 
having that, like uh, to call Raisi and after the, that call between the French president and the Iranian president, having this uh, government being formed, all of these are signs from a way. So this is the way that is coming so that then you will have uh, people sitting uh, in Vienna and definitely uh, two, two days ago with the agreement that the, um, uh, that the IEA had or the IAEA had with, the, with, the, with Iran is another sign that I think Vienna is coming back uh, and ready for, for the table for negotiations. Interesting. Victor Yang, senior editor at JLC Network Technology, mm -hmm. sitting in China. Victor, good morning, good afternoon, rather, yeah. where you're sitting. Yes. Uh, China announced yesterday that they would uh, be making announced uh, plans for the strategic reserve sales of crude oil from its strategic reserves after making the initial announcement last week. Why is China choosing to release from the reserves and not let's say, buy what it needs in the open market? Well, as we know, the country stocked up a lot of crude oil last year, say over 1.2 million barrels per day went to storage last year. And for this year, we're actually in the first seven months, well, the stock high continued to build up if we look at the official data, say about 153,000 barrels per day went to storage. If you just look at the official data, the actual throughput might be might have been higher than the official data, but the stock price well didn't drop much. I mean, didn't drop that much well in the first say seven or eight months of this year. So and now a lot of refineries were and plants were under pressure from rising cost. And this is kind of putting some downward pressure on the country's economy. And so it's, it's kind of a good time to release some of these well reserves at this moment at the time. But, if you, if yeah. you take that point, Victor, the, the, the intervention from the government into the economy releasing uh, natural uh, commodities, raw materials uh, into the market uh, in the iron ore and other areas, oil. Is that a popular move in the Chinese industry? Do they welcome it? Well, yes. Well, I think they welcome this move because, well, some large, particularly some new refineries were short of quotas. Say, particularly like Hengli Petrochemical, three large private uh, refining chemical in, um, complexes as well. They say like uh, another one, say Zhejiang Petroleum and Chemical, a large one. And it has actually shut one of the, one or two of the units or new units because of shortage of feedstock. So this is not just to kind of relieve the pressure, but also to help them get the fiscal they need at this moment. Because well, the country is now has actually has been conducting like an investigation at independence for this year. And it's still, it's still conducting an investigation in Shandong now. And so some refineries have had to cut their operating rate well, because of the investigation. And for some others where well, the quotas have been tightening so they need to get more fish stock for their new unit. So this is kind of a good timing for them. Yes. Adi, we had the OPEC uh, monthly report yesterday where they raised their forecast for 2023, the growth in global oil demand to 4.2 million barrels a day, uh, about almost a, a, a million barrels a day from its August projection, which was only you know a few weeks ago. Uh, what's changed and what are your thoughts generally on the OPEC report? Well, um, it's it's quite frankly, it was a bit, little bit puzzling. I think I think that that number is a very big number. Mm. Uh, we were surprised um, um, uh, at the OIS. Our monthly um, um, uh, paper came out as well, monthly oil outlook as well, and and what we have is a lot less. Basically, we do have a good rebound in demand, but we are seeing it probably um, around three and a half maximum million. Um, 
that compared to OPEC at 4.3 is, is a million barrels less. Um, whether we are on the right side or not, I'm not sure, but somebody like Argus has 2.8. Wow. So, you know, the numbers are very, very different. Um, uh, we, are, we are still, Sean, I think it's, it's, it's difficult for OPEC. I think it's difficult for everyone because I think we're still in the phase of the sort of demand shock. We have not exited it. COVID is still around. And there is a huge amount of uncertainty. Um, we, we, I, Asia has been affected. Um, there's cases rising in, in China as well, which is really a big one to watch uh, in, in spite of the draconian measures, because that could impact a lot. India as well. India worries me a lot because they have very low vaccination rates. And if, we, if they get an, another wave, I think that's going to impact demand a lot. I mean, there was Plus, the other side of the, 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 the increase in 22 projections for demand, but no adjustment to 2021, uh, uh, given the, what's happened in recent weeks and going into the fourth quarter, you would, I would have expected a downward revision. Absolutely. I mean, uh, we, we, we made a downward re revision by about 200,000 barrels a day. Why they didn't do it is not clear to me, I think. It's, you know, it's easy to justify because there's so much uncertainty out there, um, uh, as simple as that. But we, we certainly have a downward revision of about at least 200,000 barrels for this year. Uh, th this year is still going to remain quite, quite uh, well balanced. In fact, we, we continue to draw stocks. Q4 is going to be very, very strong. Um, a, a lot depends on China. It's good that Victor was uh, sort of giving us some information on that. I think China is going to be the key because... There are a lot of measures by the government to slow down the economy, particularly in the property sector, which will have eventually impact on demand through the sort of uh, wealth, wealth sort of um, effect. But um, at the same time, there's a lot of demand by the independent. We have to see by the end of the month, they'll get Q4 quotas. So those quotas will be very, very important to see what's going to happen and how much do they get. Um, and we do expect, um, you know, continuing strength from, from China. Um, in, in terms of balances, I think uh, OPEC is, 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 has a very, very difficult um, function here because there's just too many uncertainties. At the beginning of this conversation, we talked about the hurricane. I didn't even you know, mention the issues in Libya that we've had protests. We don't know what's going to happen there. We've got issues in Nigeria. We had Fulcaros, um, um, force majeure, which lifted again, uh, um, I think, over the weekend. We've had delays with Quaibo. Um, so it's 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 a very, very difficult one to sort of balance the market and, 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 and guess well, it. That's because why we're so fortunate to have Laurie here because he's going to tell us what's going to happen in Libya and the infamous East Med. Uh, what is happening in Libya, uh, Laurie? It does seem that um, something's going on and including the uh, Gaddafi brothers are on the move again. Yeah, so uh, don't forget that the objective is to have elections on the, 4th, the 24th of December. So uh, uh, it will be a, a big uh, issue. And not everybody wants to have elections or wants uh, change, right? There are different dynamics. There are different uh, uh, objectives in the country because there are different uh, uh, alliances, etc. Uh, we all know about the complexity. At the same time, there are who, those who want to influence the outcome of the elections if they happen. Uh, in, in different directions. So uh, what is happening today, uh, it was expected to happen because this is a power struggle between the newly appointed Minister of Oil uh, and the uh, National Oil Corporation had, uh, which and the NOC who, who has always been the uh, Minister of Oil, if you want, or the Ministry of Oil. So suddenly the NOC, who is not just a company, it is also the regulator, it does a lot of many uh, things, that, and it, it is kind of a ministry. Now they have a minister to deal with. So that kind of uh, dynamics is, needs, needs to be uh, settled. This is what they're not able to do. And it's oh, every time there is this struggle, power struggle between the minister who thinks that has an oversight role and the control over the NOC and the NOC that feels that I am an independent NOC. I've been working all these years. I've been doing all these businesses, we have the international uh, relations, we have all the international contracts, we are the ministry and not the, the minister cannot uh, come. This struggle um, is, uh, is being seen. And as you know, like it is easy, very easy to uh, mobilize people uh, to go and close the terminals. Uh, different reasons, people wanting jobs, others, it's just like political pressure. 
all of this is happening. Uh, and don't forget, like a couple of months ago, the head of the NOC refused to transfer money to the central bank because he wanted more transparency. He wanted to make sure where the money is going. So this power struggle, I think, will continue um, until we reach the elections with all the complexities, with different factions, different objectives, etc. But it, it has something to do pure management and the role of different between the different roles between the Minister of Energy newly, this is a new position, and the NOC, and there are other things related to politics and to the elections, and if they want elections or not, and if they want to keep the country stable until the 24th of December, or they want to ruin it so that we don't uh, go into the next level of stability in the country. All of that might- How vulnerable in all of that, uh, Laurie, do you think oil production is? Uh, obviously we had the very impressive recovery last year, up to 1.4 million barrels a day. Is that fragile? So fragile, yes, because we're talking about these three terminals or three uh, uh, ports that we're talking about that are like, we're talking about 800,000 barrels per day. So that is a lot. You know, and that will have a, a, an impact. So if you say now they stop with the uh, with the U.S. storms uh, season, so all of that, like it is like heavy pressure on supply side. So I think, and if we continue saying that there is this kind of uh, growth and demand, even if it's like not the growth, but it's a, it is a, a gradual growth. So then you will have, uh, you will feel it. But on the other side, uh, we might we might see uh, kind of like maybe by NG Iranian uh, oil coming back to the market. You remember we always said that uh, we they will start the negotiations to early 2021, but that doesn't mean that Iranian oil will flow uh, soon, but end of year or beginning of 2022, it might be uh, possible now. I mean, by, that, by then we might be begging for it to come back because the exactly. supply will be so tight. Uh, Victor, just picking up on that point, as Adi mentioned, it all a lot so, so much of the market depends on where China goes. You said, uh, or, or I think a few times, last time we had you on, uh, that um, the Chinese government policy this year was not prioritizing economic growth yeah. and looking at structural reform yeah. and change. And, and I suppose the question there is how to what scale they're willing to compromise growth? I mean, is it 6%? Is it 2%? We've seen now just in the news overnight that the uh, Yunnan province, the world, one of the world's largest aluminium producing provinces in China, will enforce production curbs uh, in an effort to meet energy intensity goals, uh, yeah. which of course has sent the price of aluminium up to record levels. So the, the, these policy changes are quite stringent. Yes, well, yes, indeed, the policy changes have been to a scale you had never seen in the past few years, well. And it's kind of, this kind of determination, we feel it very strong this year and say the restructuring and better play field for small and medium-sized enterprises well to make it a fair playground for all the enterprises well for everyone and this well uh, is well is pushed forward much further than before and so the country is now willing to say sacrifice some some of the growth for this year and for stable growth for the coming year as well so it's very determined to push forward with this well restructure this do year. you think we could see sub six percent growth that we could drop below that well for up to now we can still expect about six percent of growth well and because you can see from the booming trade, the falling trade and industrial production and consumption coming back, including in China too. So judging from the data up to now, we can still expect that kind of growth as well. Adi, once upon a time uh, in, in the world of oil markets, we used to have a thing called the geopolitical premium. Uh, uh, that added a few dollars to the price. Um, 
Now I'm wondering, should we have a climate change premium, given the scale of the weather we're seeing and the case in point in the Gulf of Mexico, the recovery is just much, much slower. And I'm just wondering, how does one start to adjust that in their thinking on the markets? Sure, I think it's an excellent point. Um, uh, we, we have been discussing it here. Um, uh, what, what's obviously happening is with climate change, you've got more energy use. For a start, you've got higher demand because of what weather. Um, I think BBC Today reported that um, days of 50 plus temperatures have doubled over the last 10 years, which is incredible. At the same time, you've got supply disruptions. So you can see constantly, you know, we've got two big storms in the, in the US Gulf in two weeks. Um, so on one hand, your climate change is increasing demand. On the other hand, it's actually affecting supplies. And of course, we've got the uh, highest energy um, um, uh, prices in Europe now in, 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 I don't know, 11, 12 years. So, um, you know, something has to give. I think uh, Spain's come out already with attempts to cap those prices, which is not really helping instead of giving needy the money. Capping prices only reduces supply, increases demand, making things just, just worse. So I totally agree with you. I think um, we should soon be having some sort of premium on, 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 on that instead of geopolitical premium because we are getting affected um, uh, all the time uh, in, in all walks of energy. But it's actually, be, we, we're being affected now, diesel demand's picking up because diesel generators are being used a lot more because of uh, various fires, because of supply crunch uh, in, in terms of electricity demand and so on. At the same time, energy and, uh, and, and the Germans keep shutting nukes, which is really not helping anyone. So um, yes, I totally agree with you. It's very, very- And, and on the backside of this uh, storm, this Hurricane Ida, Adi, is not only the delay of the recovery, but as a result of the disruption, and now we're into the third week, I think, or getting there for the recovery, that it distorts the, the trading patterns. You know, the, the idea that, uh, what used to go over here is not going over here. So how is it being replaced and so forth? What, what kind of legacy would be happening at this time on, on that? Well, absolutely. Look at, if you look at Ida, for example, for a start, the production has been lagging behind, whereas the refineries have actually come back relatively quickly. So we had two big refineries in, in the US, uh, uh, Exxon and, and, and uh, uh, Philip 66, two refineries are about 1.1 million barrels a day came back rather quickly, but production didn't, was quite lagging behind. So of course you've got that demand supply, suddenly you've got arbitrage for, for, for moving oil, moving out of actually Russia being a very important supply to the US East Coast uh, as well. So you, you've got these changes. The other thing is also uh, Hurricane Ida actually did not affect very much automotive sector. It, mobility remained very, very high. So on one hand, you've got a, a, a big demand, but re, sort of demand staying pretty much the same, whereas supply has been tightened both on the refinery side and the production side. So yes, there are all sorts of uh, disruptions that, that we, we're not used to, and they're changing sort of supply patterns in, in terms of both particularly products, but crude oil as well. Let's uh, go to the survey question, which sort of addresses this point and, and get the room's view on that. Is it time to include a climate change premium in oil price after Texas ice storm in Q1 and now Ida hurricane? Both show that legacy energy infrastructure is no longer fit for purpose in terms of recovering quickly from new scale of weather events. So when the wind blows, we have to forecast a much bigger disruption to oil supply than might have been previously the case. Uh, I know traders always were very blasé about hurricanes. Oh yeah, they'll be back on the rigs in a few days. Uh, that's turning out to be a little bit different. So I welcome your views on that. Um, and we'll see where, where that goes. Uh, Laurie, the, the situation in the Middle East, you referenced on it regarding the nuclear talks, um, the Iranian nuclear talks, the rapprochement. My question is, uh, is this a priority for the region? Uh, we had a speaker on last week, a long-serving U.S. diplomat, former U.S. diplomat, saying that the markets are totally underestimating what's at risk here between Israel and Iran. Uh, and I'm wondering, is there, because there's long been a, a sort of a narrative that, oh, well, there's many actors in the region who do not want this deal rehabilitated and are quite powerful in impacting that. I'm just wondering, where do you think that chessboard is now? 
Uh, look, it's uh, what we're seeing now. It's uh, uh, we're a bit like uh, uncertain about where the U.S. is going in the region, you know. And we are feeling that the vacuum that the U.S. is leaving behind, it's being filled by the French. And the French, they have one purpose, which is more of like finding new markets for them. And this is where we see like when you signing big the, deals in Iraq, exactly, twenty six billion dollars. So, exactly. And when you see uh, Mr. Macron going to this Iraqi. Uh, uh, led conference about the region, the role of Iraq and Iraq being a platform to bring on all these uh, different factions from Saudis to Iranians uh, and seeing the French there. The second day you see Total there with seven, $27 billion of uh, investment in the oil and gas and renewable sector. Um, uh, we, we haven't seen a lot of uh, discussions between the French and the Israelis, so we don't know where they stand on this, if the French are going to come back to this. We know that the French are uh, really in good terms with the Iranians, as I said at the beginning, uh, and this is leading to certain, uh, uh, certain, uh, um, if you want, uh, solutions like in Lebanon, uh, in the, the Iraqi investment, uh, and then uh, most probably some French investment in Iran. Uh, so, but no, no dialogue between Israel and France on that. Uh, the Israelis are still looking for a role to, for the U.S. in this against Iran. Uh, but for now, uh, again, my question is, uh, or my, what we're thinking about is uh, the U.S., the Israelis didn't react uh, much about the, Israeli, uh, about the Iranian tanker that was destined to Lebanon but docked in Syria and the product will come in. So what does that mean? It's something evolving that we need to look at. Is there a new... Uh, a new um, uh, a dynamics that is being set. All of that is to be seen. We are looking at that, but we don't see the Israelis uh, being a la Bibi, Netanyahu, uh, reacting to what's happening. So it's a new dynamics that we have to uh, start looking at and understanding how Na Naftali Bennett and his, and his crew uh, see the things and how they, uh, they work uh, around these things. Victor, uh, we have a very big storm brewing, so to speak, in Asia, and that is the price of LNG. Uh, uh, now already at a very high level, we haven't even hit winter yet. I'm wondering from your perspective, what is going to be the sort of impact of that and relevance for China? Well, the uh, LNG prices have been kind of surging this year and in part because of the, well, growing demand mostly is particularly from China too. And the impact would be, well, well, China as well, China would have to kind of, well, had to stock up a lot of LNG, I mean, for winter, winter heating in Northern China. So no matter how pricey the energy is, well, because, well, we, we still rely a lot on gas for heating in winter. So this price well, will not hit demand from China at least much. And now Sinopec, Petro China still has been, actually have been building storages for uh, peak saving LNG uh, this year too. So they've been building more and more tanks for well gas well. And so as, as domestic, Production is not strong enough to meet demand, and they still would still rely rely a lot on imported cargo as well. So this will not change the trend much. I mean, for is, the, is China likely to resort to burning more coal this winter, given the price of LNG? Well, not quite significantly, I think. Well, because of the policy, we are now the country is well, more determined, more resolved than ever to cut emission this year. Well, all the enterprises in China are striving to meet the new and highest standard, emission standard this year. They strive harder this year. So it's not likely to burn much more coal for, I mean, because of the price run. Okay. Well, let's get the survey resolved and give Addy the last word. A big yes on that, Addy, perhaps no surprise. But nonetheless, your thoughts on the 
resurging oil price, given all of the dynamics that we have in the market at the moment, the outages, the demand recovery, where it is, uh, are we migrating to that Goldman Sachs eighty dollars and beyond? I think um, if you don't, if you just let me to uh, just yes. a little step back um, on on the answer questions, you, you can see this uh, a premium actually in in the LNG market more than you. Right. Oil. Yes. Uh, Very I mean, good point. Yeah. Trading in January over twenty four dollars. That's Fukushima type of levels, if not higher. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but yes, uh, the whole the whole energy sector looks extremely tight. Um, I am I'm quite bullish about oil at the moment. Um, I think for this at least two or three uh, months, because um, I think indicators that we should watch this uh, this week. Um, there are about two or three BLCCs with 40s crude um, in the off the coast of UK, probably ready to move to China. I think uh, that will be a big indicator of of the demand pull from China. I think the one that we have to worry about a little bit is this SPI in China, which we mentioned early on because of the uncertainty regarding the volume. Uh, it was discussed anything between 30 and 70 million barrels. I mean, that, that's a lot, lot, lot of crude that could be added to the market. But it, in spite of that, I think by the end of the month, we'll see the quotas for Q, for, for, for Q4 for um, Chinese independent refiners. And I would expect some good, strong demand to reappear. And with all the um, uncertainties, outages on the supply side from um, from uh, Nigeria to Angola um, and Azerbaijan, uh, plus you know uh, uh, potential storms in the U.S. because the season is not over, I think is going to um, keep the market uh, tight, especially in in a situation where we're still drawing at least half a million barrels per day. So we are well below five-year stocks. Uh, that will keep market backward. And reasonably tight. So I'm quite positive. I think we could see blip to $80. We don't see there be staying very long because balances for next year are a lot better. And as you always point out, there's a magic 5 million of excess capacity out there that can be supplied. And Saudis are doing 9-7 already. So Well, I think that's the interesting point to finish up on. And ultimately that the lack of investment into CapEx, into new supply uh, capacity out on the medium term may come a little bit closer because the ability of, of, of certain actors that we perceive to have idle supply immediately available actually isn't so immediately available. So there might be a greater tightness that we, than we perceive. But anyway, that's a wrap. Adi, thank you as always. Really great to have your insights. Victor from China and Laurie from Lebanon, best of luck with all the developments there. Hopefully they will turn the lights on. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll catch up every morning, 10.30 UAE time. Have a good day.